welcome to your emergency medicine rotation. We're glad to have you join us. Today, we want to talk about one of the fundamental skills in emergency medicine, patient presentations. Now you'll notice there are features about the emergency department that shape the way we present. Things here happen very fast. Medical patient, room three, now. The acuity is very high. Trauma team, room one, Yes, now. please take him to room one. I will be right there. And there tend to be multiple distractions. Excuse me. Yes, patient's INR is seven. Got it. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I agree. Thank you. Definitely a STEMI. Let's activate the cath lab right away. Thank you. So in order to be able to function in this environment, we have to make sure our presentations are concise, organized, and focused on the emergent issues. There's a presentation going on right now. Let's see how it's done. Hi, Dr. Mitro. Yes. I have a patient I'm ready to present whenever you're ready. Sure, go ahead. Um, so I just saw Mr. Ferguson. He's over in room four. Mm -hmm. um, he's a 64-year-old male. He has a history of osteoarthritis of the left knee, mm -hmm. uh, anxiety, high blood pressure, glaucoma, diabetes, carpal tunnel syndrome, hyperlipidemia, and gout that mostly hits his right great toe. His pain started uh, a few days ago when he was drinking tea. He typically drinks chamomile, but he had run out and got some peppermint and thought perhaps that was what was going on. Uh, on social history, Mr. Ferguson uh, doesn't smoke. He does drink the occasional glass of dry red wines, uh, and he lives at home with two pet chihuahuas, and their names are Honey and Bear, which I thought was just kind of cute. On exam, um, Mr. Ferguson is in no acute distress. He has blue eyes. His neck was supple. Uh, there was no cervical adenopathy. It's definitely not anything cardiac. I mean, he looks really, really well. Um, but uh, doctor, Dr. Mitra, you have a pulse? Doctor, I need a doctor. Perhaps that was not the best example. Let's talk more about how to present in the ED. Presenting is not about restating all of your findings. Rather, it should be a synthesis of your findings to help shape future medical decision making. Now, there are different ways to conceptualize this process. The one we want to share with you today is to think about presenting like telling a story. Now, like any good story, your presentation should have a beginning, middle, and end. Your beginning is your introductory statement that contains the patient demographics, the pertinent past medical history, and the reason for the visit. The middle of your presentation is the crux. It's where you develop your characters, which in this context are the disease conditions you're considering, either because they carry high probability or high risk. And your ending is your differential diagnosis and management plan. Now it's important that your presentations do not read like a mystery novel in which your audience is completely clueless about where the story is going and what's going on. Instead, your differential diagnosis is the focal point upon which to build your narrative. In fact, your listeners should be able to anticipate your differential diagnosis based on the preceding narrative. Your introductory statement sets the stage for the rest of the presentation by making the reason for the visit clear, as well as creating a backdrop or frame for the conditions that your patient may be at risk for based on their predisposing factors. So let's go back to Mr. Ferguson. He's a gentleman with diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and arthritis. Let's say the reason for his visit is that he was found unresponsive with a blood glucose of 20. In that scenario, you want to highlight that he's a diabetic patient who's on an oral hypoglycemic agent. If, however, the reason for his visit is that he developed severe lip swelling, then the items you want to pull into your frame is that he has high blood pressure and that he's on an ACE inhibitor, setting the stage for angioedema. Notice that in either scenario, his high cholesterol and arthritis are not relevant, so they do not necessarily need to be presented. You're using your ending to help shape the beginning of your narrative. The middle of your presentation is the crux in which you develop your characters, which in this context are the disease conditions you are considering, either because they carry high probability or high risk. In general, you want to think early about the life and limb-threatening conditions that use them to help shape your assessment. So with chest pain, think about the myocardial infarction, the pulmonary embolism, or the aortic dissection, even before you walk into the room. If it's right lower quadrant pain, think about appendicitis, ovarian torsion, or atopic pregnancy. The earlier you start considering these do not miss diagnoses, the better you'll be at looking for them and using them to shape your narrative. Now, each of these characters also have their mini stories, which are the classic presentations or patterns of disease. So for example, with unstable angina, it's the new or accelerating chest pressure that's worse with exertion and better with rest. With appendicitis, it's the migratory right lower quadrant pain that's associated with fever, anorexia, and nausea. 
You want to be proactive in looking for these patterns of disease early on to help organize your findings. So rather than randomly present the quality of the pain, the radiation of the pain, or the severity of the pain, extract and organize them into a way that fits within the many stories of the disease conditions you are considering. So in general, in emergency medicine, we don't use the headings of past medical history, family history, social history, review systems. Rather, we incorporate the relevant items from each of these topics into one big historical narrative. So the pertinent past medical history gets incorporated into the introductory statement. The relevant items from the review systems becomes part of the mini stories for the disease conditions that you are considering. For medications and allergies, you should always obtain them and review them with your patient. However, there may be some practice variation about whether you should represent them in total or review them together in front of the electronic health record. For physical exam, vital signs should always be presented and you should highlight abnormalities or otherwise you can globally refer to them with terms such as unremarkable. Be sure to describe the general appearance of your patient and for the remainder of your exam, you can use the reason for the visit as well as the differential diagnosis to decide what is pertinent and what is non-contributory and can be excluded. If there's any available data such as EKG, labs, or radiographic studies, you can present these as well, but once again, focusing on items that inform your differential diagnosis. Your ending is your differential diagnosis and management plan. In other words, what do you think is going on with the patient and how do you want to manage their care? It's important that your differential diagnosis is not a random list of diagnostic considerations, but rather should be stratified on probability and risk of harm. So one such classification scheme is to start with first, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? Or, especially with critical care patients, what is the imminent diagnosis that must be readily addressed? Secondly, present the high risk or do not miss conditions that may not necessarily be the most likely, but still need to be excluded. Thirdly, are the do not miss diagnosis that you have considered, but yet you feel have been excluded this time based on your history, physical exam, and initial data. It's important that you at least consider these diagnoses, otherwise you run the risk of missing them. So you should always regard the conditions that pose risk to life, limb, or reproductive ability in your differential diagnosis. Lastly, you have the option of presenting conditions that pose low risk and are also of low to moderate probability. Your management plan can be divided into diagnostics, therapeutics, and disposition. So different institutions may have nuances in terms of how they like things being presented. But this concept of thinking about your presentations as telling a story will help you make them more concise and a synthesized version of your findings that prioritizes the identification and exclusion of do not miss diagnoses. I think our doctor has been revived and our students gonna try again applying these concepts. Let's go see how it goes this time around. Hey, Dr. Mitra? Yes. I'm ready to present a patient whenever you are. Sure. I learned a lot from last time. Me too. Okay. So Mr. Ferguson is a 64-year-old male with a history of diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia who comes in with a chief complaint of chest pain for the last three days. He describes it as a substernal burning, and he gets about five to ten episodes a day. Mm -hmm. He first noticed it after he was drinking some tea, but then he's also had multiple unprovoked episodes as well. The pain is neither exertional nor is it pleuritic, and it doesn't radiate to his back or anywhere else. He does get some shortness of breath with the pain, but he doesn't have any nausea, vomiting, or diaphoresis. He doesn't have any leg swelling, fevers, cough, or abdominal pain either. Mr. Ferguson takes gliburide, lisinopril, and simvastatin. He doesn't have any drug allergies, and he doesn't smoke. On physical exam, Mr. Ferguson's vital signs were unremarkable. He's comfortable and well-appearing. He doesn't have any JVD. His lungs were clear. His heart exam was with a regular rate and rhythm without any murmurs, gallops, or rubs. His abdominal exam was benign and he did have intact and symmetric distal pulses without any lower extremity edema or tenderness. His EKG is here. I looked at it, it looked like it was in normal sinus rhythm without any acute ischemic changes. For my assessment and plan, Mr. Ferguson is a 64-year-old gentleman who comes in with multiple cardiac risk factors with the chief complaint of substernal chest pain. For my differential, the fact that the pain is burning and he notices it mostly after T makes me think of something GI-like reflux as the most probable diagnosis, but he does have multiple cardiac risk factors and he has had the spontaneous episodes of pain as well, which make me concerned enough that we should rule out the acute coronary syndrome. He doesn't have any pleuritic pain or any signs or symptoms of DVT to make me strongly suspect a PE. He doesn't have any tearing pain, he's normotensive, and he doesn't have any pulse deficits to make me strongly suspect a dissection either. For my plan, I'd like to get a CBC, a BMP, a set of cardiac biomarkers, a chest x-ray, and give him aspirin. Currently, he's chest pain-free, and we can reassess the need for further analgesia later. 
For disposition, uh, Mr. Ferguson, if his first set of enzymes comes back negative, I'd still like to bring him into our chest pain observation center to f complete a rule out and get a functional study in the morning. Great assessment and good plan. Thank you. There you have it. There's nothing like a great story and a well-crafted, concise presentation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.